Welcome to the Eat, Stay, Love podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Wendy Poishbeg, and today I'm talking with Brenda Wilson of Die Hard RC. Brenda is an amazing woman, a tenacious community builder who was able to shed the corporate handcuffs to create a community around the hobby she loved, RC and drone racing. Please enjoy this conversation with Brenda Wilson of Die Hard RC on the Eat, Stay, Love podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So, Brenda, um, thank you so much for being out here today or being here today. I'm super excited. I was thinking about, you know, today when I was, you know, reading about one of our friends, Jessica Martin from Rabbit's Pantry that we yeah. met a couple of years ago um, at a, a, a women's networking meeting mm-hmm. that you actually are on the board of or the founder of and that at that meeting two years ago, you had described that you were considering quitting your corporate job Mm -hmm. in order to do this dream of um, RC racing and that months later you actually did it. You cut the cord. And so do you want to start by telling us a little bit about, first of all, you, who you are, and how you started off on this amazing adventure. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, you mentioned professional networking women. Uh, Jessica founded it, and I was a co-founder, and we just wanted to be able to give back to other women who were professionals and or business owners and help like build skills. Um, You know, there's a lot of like women's networking group that are very social and we wanted to kind of be able to um, educate and, and, and bring women together to share resources. Uh, And we've uh, continued to work a little bit on that, but our businesses have both grown so much in the past two years. It's really hard uh, when you're like uh, have momentum and you're growing to to do a lot of yeah because that's what's so amazing is two years ago there was about nine women around the table yeah and I can think of six that have launched businesses and are in full scale business mode they're not yeah. dreaming about it they're actually um, open doors started brick and mortars cut cords yeah. all of them and so um, it really is a testament about you know, the, the leadership of that group and, and who you cultivated friendships with and how yeah. you helped each other. Well, we um, met through Snohomish Networking Women, and that's an amazing networking group of women who it's very social, all business owners. And we just saw something really special there. And there wasn't anything further north. Um, and I like kind of share space between Lake Stevens and Snohomish and Camino Island. Um, and so we wanted to create something kind of central and, um, yeah, it's, it was, it's awesome. I think our, um, passion is around building community and sharing knowledge and empowering women. And that's kind of where it started with us together. Um, and then, the women that came alongside when you're speaking certain language and you're putting it out to the universe, you know, you're saying what you're, you want to do and right. um, you're taking action and, and that kind of, you start building um, a network of, of women just organically. And uh, it's, a, it's really cool to see how, um, especially like to see you, how you've expanded um, in your skill set and your knowledge base yeah. and just your community. And, and I think, That's always needed. Women just need to, we do so much when we come together. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, The reason I went to that networking meeting that night is I had discovered that women support women so easily. And I had always not, I had had made some assumptions based on my own biases that women wouldn't support other women and discovered that that completely wasn't true. And so I started investing Uh, more time and energy and I say investing because really when they do build each other up it's because they had been investing in relationships and cultivating uh, businesses um, business relationships with each other and the ones that are the quickest to help each other out are the ones that have also been mentored and um, had been investing in others as well so and that was a perfect example of what that group was and what I found um, from from joining in with that. And so, Mm. so take us back to your corporate life and how you decided, you know, to cut the cord. Um, you're, you're a successful businesswoman. How did drone, how did this love of RCs come into it? Because you're, (laughs) you're good at both. So you could, you could, you could choose, right? 
Um, well, the, the, the RC cars was where it started with my husband. Like we've been married 26 years and he was into RC cars and it would, um, kind of separate us. So he'd go and do that and I'd find something else for me to do because, um, I ha- the track that they would go to is clay or dirt and very dusty, and they use this uh, chemicals on their tires that I have an allergy to. And oh. so I, w- part of the reason why we started was I wanted to RC. I wanted to be part of that community too because yeah. it was such a cool uh, community that really came together, and uh, the technology was awesome. Uh, and you know, my corporate gig, I worked for Comcast 27 years. I was um, in leadership. Um, I was a manager doing market development for f- commercial fiber optic engineers. Um, so I was a- always the only woman in the room. And, uh, you know, when you talk about when women come along and mentor you, um, you changed biases that you had had growing up. Um, and the same for me. I was always the only woman. I was a, a, to- a tomboy growing up. Um, I was, you know, an only child in uh, for a long time until, you know, I was like 12. Um, and so... You know, I think it was something that um, another woman came up to me when I was uh, building my career in a corporate environment, and I was just surrounded by guys, and they just, you know, I always felt like I was in the back in the corner somewhere, um, and always trying to prove myself. Right. And she came alongside and was the first woman that actually, um, she had an office and she was traveling, and I was sitting in this, like I was moving desks all the time, but I was trying to run a team, and she gave me her office. Thanks. And and it was one, it was, uh, there was just a moment there, um, everything changed. And mm-hmm. then that, that person um, continued and she became my mentor. And then I started building and asking other women to, to mentor me because I felt like um, I'd always had really difficult relationships with women and never could connect. And it was a work. It was work right. to um, change how I communicate and to change uh, what I, f- my vulnerability Right. Um, to put myself out there and to um, actually embrace other women was hard for me. I'd always get really nervous. And, um, you know, so yeah. I, I find the, the when one of the things that I try and do is when I'm most scared about something or I feel like I'm out of my element, um, that's kind of where I head. Um, because I feel like I'm challenging myself mm-hmm. by going towards what I'm the most fearful about um there's a reason you know you got to go towards that to to grow Get and, out of your comfort zone um, and, and so yeah. yeah I think I think my whole path from you know back when I was in the military um has always been followed like okay what am I freaking out about uh I guess that's where I'm supposed to go <laughs> and um it's kind of led me here and still I continue you know to follow that like things that I don't understand or things that make me fearful um you know, or, you know, the the voices that you get in your head that say that you're not good enough to do something. Um, Those are the things that I really try and uh, master. Got it. Got it. So you, when did you know that I need to, I need to leave this corporate job? This is, I, I, you know, I would prefer to, or when did you know that this was a business that could be an, a viable yeah. business? That that's the key. Um, we started in 2015, and we just we wanted um, to bring a track that was from Europe. It was a turf type of surface, so um, it was clean. And I at that time I was involved. Um, as a coach uh, for FIRST Robotics through Comcast, I really got involved in a lot of nonprofits. And um, I started working with a lot of youth and and girls specifically uh, and veterans through Comcast. Uh, And it was just a great avenue because you had this big company that you could come in and um, you could kind of vet out different nonprofits and things like that. So I really got to uh, meet a lot of people and network through that. And, um, I just saw something really cool, especially with First Robotics. That was when I first said, hey, there's this RC car thing, and it's all guys. I mean, it was very rare that you saw kids at the track, and it was even more rare to see a wife at the track. And um, I said, well, what if we built, like, a community? What if we brought something that was clean and we thought about 
the families as well as the drivers right. and not just catered to the drivers, although that's important. You have to, and I leave that to my husband and his crew. Um, we call them the Rugrats, and they're amazing. <laughs> and um, they're constantly innovating and making the track better. And uh, so I let them worry about, like, the being fast and um, being competitive and world class in that aspect. And I really focus on building the community and bringing families in because that's kind of the key. So the, before you're, so it was normally a, uh, a guy sport. Yeah. And what you were bringing was, you know, new turf and, you know, clean and allowing families to be able to be yeah. together instead of like, okay, honey, I'm going off to the track and, and mm -hmm. instead cultivating a, a whole family dynamic. And it like something special really happened. Um, like our first race, we rented out um, the soccer dome in Snohomish and it, I mean, we uh, bought all this turf from like a place that was going out of business. It's, uh, you know, and uh, it was really heavy. Like rolls were 700 pounds. And um, we uh, we really put the guys to work and we were putting turf on top of turf because the uh, soccer dome was t turf surface, but it was really thick. So um, it was like pulling Velcro at the end of the night because we're tra we travel. We lease or we rent a facility, we bring the track in, we set it up, and then we race, and then we have to tear it down. And so those okay. first uh, couple years, it was a lot of work. You know, we were constantly like, oh, we can't, we're, somebody's going to get hurt. This is a lot of weight. Um, we kept asking for more and more volunteers. And so it's been really cool from that, uh, you know, we started out, you know, we went for broke. It was like, what can we afford? And um, let's just throw it together and see what happens. And so many people showed up and they brought their whole families. And there was uh, the people that were there were like, I've never seen this many kids at a, at a track. You know, it's pretty, pretty awesome. And we were really pushing like getting new people into the hobby. Um, and we had done an event at the Hobby Expo at the fairgrounds. Um, we've done that event every year um, since. It's it's pretty amazing how it's grown um, and how we've been able to now uh, partner with them to continue to grow the RC industry through the Hobby Expo. Um, but that first year we, we were there, uh, we put out a little sign that home wanted oh, um, okay. because you know we don't have a, a, a brick and mortar <laughs> yeah yeah and and um the property owner where we're at now um uh, he came up and he said hey I have a piece of property maybe you could do an RC track out there come and take a look and so we went and it just timing wise we couldn't and just um you know resources uh, it was really exp it would be really expensive to build the track out there but I had started seeing on YouTube and um, in some like uh, some groups that were kind of like in the background around the, you know, the community doing uh, drone racing. And um, I said, let's try that because that looks pretty cool. And we started looking into it and, you know, it's gates and we started out very small uh, and that 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 exploded and after that yeah, everything I saw changed it was obstacle gaps and gates or something yeah, like that it's yeah it's pretty amazing the drones can go over 100 miles an hour um they're like um they're and they're amazing because they're built from the frame up and so it's like it's robotics and um you know uh engineering and mechanical and you know it it's constantly changing and that's one of the the issues is that it's when we started, it was at its infancy. So there was a lot of breakage and there was a lot of learning. And um, when you fly drones, you fly what's called first person view. You wear goggles uh, and there's a camera in the drone that um, sends an analog signal to the goggles. Uh, and it's completely immersive. It's it's very amazing. Um, we we that was when I something I said, you know, this would be great for veterans. Yeah. that suffer from PTSD because um, if you suffer from PTSD, the hardest part of that is you can't get out of your head. And um, when you're flying a drone, you're out of your head. You're in the drone. You're right. you're immersed in that. And um, it just, there's something really special about it. And um, it's just continued to evolve. Yeah. So um, when you decided to add drones to the family of services that yeah. you were doing, that's when you were able to build your business enough where you could 
Then that's when my husband quit his job. Oh, so he, okay. So. Yep. And then he started doing it full time. I was still working um, my corporate gig, uh, you know, to really pay the bills and uh, everything is self-funded. So, um, you know, there's it it is expensive to build a technology company from the ground up, especially something like I said, is ever changing. Yeah, because I mean, it is a technology company because when somebody comes in, do they they don't bring their own. Um, cars and drones, right? They, they lease them from you or they rent them? Subscribe? No, they bring their own. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so then um, how uh, with the technology then, because it it's ever evolving, are they always improving yeah. or they're having to upgrade? Yeah. they're um, Or things break or uh, the big thing now is weight. Like, you know, you want to go faster right. and um, you want it to be stronger and you want it to to not have any video issues or any communication issues. So it's constantly, oh, this is new, so I have to change this out. Or, oh, if I rebuild my drone um, because there's a new frame that's a half of whatever. (laughs) You know, it's always they're like measuring and weighing. And um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing to watch Um, it. There's a big learning curve in the in the drones. Um, What I train on is like the one you see in front of you, um, the AP drone. So um, aerial photography drone, Uh, Yeah, which I think is beautiful. I just love I just love the footage that you can get. I, I I don't know if I ever told you that I decided that, you know, after seeing, after seeing the results of aerial drone photography, I was just hell bent on getting my own drone and that I just had to have my Mm -hmm. own and I wanted those shots. I wanted to be able to incorporate them into my blog. Yeah. And I, you know, was counsel that that probably wasn't the greatest idea you should just hire it out there's it's not as easy as it seems and I'm not you know I'm not a video gamer I you know it's my my the opportunities that I've had to play around with it are zero yeah but I was not gonna I was not going to back down and so I bought a drone I met somebody in the Starbucks parking lot and picked a toy up and with watched a couple YouTube videos thinking that I can master it. And from liftoff for a minute, I was able to keep it in the air. And then I flew it right into the tallest tree in the neighborhood. <laughs> so yeah. that thing's never come out of the closet ever since. <laughs> I definitely needed your help. So I could have learned how to do this. And I hear that quite often. Do you? And that yeah. doesn't surprise me because it is not as easy as it looks. I mean, the results are fantastic, but you really do need to have a skill. Yeah. And you can't control the wind. So if you're not prepared or have the skills to be able to keep that to dock or to to go where you want it, you know, I can see it's an (laughs) an expensive thing. But the other thing I read about, and I was wondering your thoughts, is that with the the first person view, um, that people feel like they're, inside of an aerial without the 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 ability to get hurt they're going so fast that Mm -hmm. if they were to do that you know flying in a you know obviously you'd have to get a pilot's license but being able to go at that kind of speed you could die and so this is gives you that kind of that feeling without actually okay so is that your been your experience yeah and that's why i think um Drones are great for people that have mobility issues. Um, maybe they uh, can't walk, or they've lost a limb, or they're in a wheelchair, or they suffer they suffer from PTSD or some other um, debilitating uh, problem that they they have. And um, it it gets you completely out of your body. It, it's you, you have to try it. I'll have to get a pair of goggles on you. Yeah, so I you would like to try. try it. I would it definitely out. like to try it. So you leave. When do you leave your corporate gig? When do um, you know it's like this is exactly what this is this is the pathway I want to go. Yeah. Well, I'd been thinking uh, things were going so fast and it was really hard to work um in a leadership position that really required a lot of time and energy and travel. Uh it, it was starting to take a toll because I the community I knew that if I had the time what I could do with it um and that people wanted to support us. They were asking for more. And I mean, that's kind of what you want in your business. It's like, please give us more. Please, uh, you know, do these things and um, make it happen. And, uh, you know, it, for me to leave my corporate gig, of, of course, a lot had to happen for that to to even be possible. Um, you know, a, a 
with a corporate paycheck comes a corporate house and yeah. corporate bills. And, right. you know, you, you kind of end up spending what you make or putting your lifestyle in a certain position. And um, so before I even made the decision, it was like, if I was to make this decision, um, you know, what's the worst that could happen? And the worst that could happen is that I'd be homeless. And I knew that I would never actually be homeless because we have so many amazing uh, friends and family that it just, you know, it, it, that's the worst that could happen. And if that did happen, we'd be okay. Yeah. And the next thing was, okay, I don't want to be homeless. So how can we make this happen? And um, that was when we decided to sell everything. And now we full-time RV. And uh, yeah, so you sold your big, large house. Yeah acreage and then everything all its contents and completely downsized into a fifth wheel yeah and so how's that been it's been amazing like so freeing um I was just so fearful I I, I started when I when I really started uh downsizing that takes time and I didn't give myself a lot of time like once I decided um that I was leaving my corporate gig and everything aligned and um luckily uh I'd been there a long time and um some positions had changed and they offered me a severance and that was kind of the kick that I needed because I was like I don't think I can do this and not get paid um while I'm making the transition so uh that helped. And from that, I went into a program called uh, Veterans in Residence. Uh, it's Bunker Labs. Uh, it partners with WeWork and they gave me a facility, you know, an office and a nice. space to start like really f thinking about envisioning uh, what would I want a company to look like if, you know, money wasn't an option? What, how would I want that to look and what, where would I need to go and what would I need to do? Um, and, you know, I couldn't have done that if I wouldn't have for just said, okay, I'm starting over. I'm hitting the reset button. Um, and, and as I started downsizing everything, I realized that for so many years I was paying for a place to put all my stuff. I know. Once you kind of get to the point where you're like, wow, I park outside and have a storage unit and a garage filled with stuff. And yeah. like, what is the point? Yeah. So, um, I want to take you, take you to this time where, you know, you've started your company, you've, um, or you're, you're in the midst of it, you're, um, gaining in popularity and somebody steals all of your stuff. Yeah. Can we talk about that? I mean, yeah. that was, I mean, national or not national coverage, huge amounts of we regional did actually co get coverage some national, because yeah. of, you know, the whole thing was just really tragic so it could was. you walk us through that you know yeah uh, well we had you know it had I left um it was about seven months ago and we were really thinking 2019 we I wanted to start all of these um STEM education programs in schools and I knew that I was going to do summer camps I mean that whole thing with me going into the um a we work facility and really like sketching out what do I want it to look like well you know I really looked and uh, made proposals like if I wanted to work with the best companies in RC what would those companies be um, I'd really done the work of sending out like proposals we've been doing this we have this community it's amazing um, and so we had gotten some donations um, some companies were talking with us um, you know it was just starting to get like some momentum and about two weeks after I sent those letters out uh we got a call um that somebody had broken into our equipment trailer you know because we're we live in a fifth wheel so all of our um technology equipment all all of our programs were in a like a 20-foot uh, equipment utility trailer and um it was completely empty like, uh, when we looked back on the video, they had been, they probably took like five hours and just came back and forth and unloaded the trailer in oh the snow gosh. when we had the big snowstorm right. last season. So, you know, here we are thinking, okay, these programs are going to be amazing. Um, we got, we've, we're doing what we want to do and, um, things are, there's momentum. And then that happened. And I was just like, it was heartbreaking, wasn't it? Yeah. Cause you, you think all these doors are opening um, for a reason. Like, I really believe that the doors open because that's the direction I'm supposed to be going. Right. And, um, and, and it's my passion. And I feel that we, uh, 
really impact a, a pretty big community of people. Um, and, and then to have it all stole away like that yeah. was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was um, tragic. And then I think about what I saw was that the community completely rallied yeah. around you. And not only did you get, you know, this regional and national media coverage, uh, your community came out and donated money to get your programs back up and yeah. running. And um, how how long were you down for? So when the theft happened, we run races every two weeks. So the theft happened and we had a race in a week. Oh, wow. So um, that the first thing was, what do we need to make that race happen? And um, I knew that something special was happening about. So when, when we went there and we met the police at the trailer, because it was um, stored outside of a, a church, church that we yeah. were doing some STEM programs with uh, the house church in Snohomish. That's also where we rent out and run our indoor programs as a house church. And they've been amazing partners for us. And um they were leaving, letting us have our trailer there um, because of the snow. Right. And um, we were we met with them, the police, and we were taking pictures. And I just I went live and just told everybody what had happened. Right. And it was crazy. And within four hours, somebody had created uh, a GoFundMe. Right. Right. And by the next morning, there was already $5,000 in the yeah. GoFundMe. And um, we were getting calls from all these different news stories. I mean, that first day, uh, we were pretty dark on social media just because we were putting our heads down, like, what do we need? What was in the trailer? How do we handle this? Um, because what we ended up finding out was because of where the trailer was at the church, although they were being amazing and letting us store it there, um, because it was stored there, there wasn't any insurance that covered it. Okay. Um, so it was a total loss for us. Right. Uh, but what ended up happening is, in the end, the community um, made $10,000 on the GoFundMe. Uh, all of the businesses that we'd sent those proposals to, the best businesses in the industry that we said, if we would work with the best, here's what we would do. And we just sent them proposals. They now saw where we had on paper that there was a community that supported, supported yeah. us. Yeah. They saw it in action. Yeah. And um, they saw our social media just explode right. um, within just a couple of days. Like the, uh, our post had been shared like a hundred thousand. I mean, it was just crazy. It, it went really viral. Great. It was viral. Um, right. And it was, it was at that time. I, it was, um, I knew this was where, where I was supposed to be. Nice. So um, just to cut to the chase, um, they got they got the thief. That yeah. He uh, actually had taken a picture of himself flying the drone, so he got himself completely on camera, mm -hmm. and it was really quite yeah. um, easy to figure out who it was, from what I understand. So well, he, because of the community coming together and sharing um, the videos and pictures <laughs> that we had taken, uh, we had... Uh, at the church, they had a video um, camera. And so uh, the guy that stole it, I won't say his name, but um, the guy that stole it, uh, his friends turned him in because it was hot. And he, right. he had stolen a lot of equipment. There was no way he could get rid of any of it. Right. Um, it was it was all out there. And they had uh, Autel Robotics, who I work with, um, the Autel Evo. Uh, I use all of those for my training. Um, they had just donated a bunch for the our programs. So they had stolen all of those. And somebody said the van that had some of our stuff in it was at this location. And the police went there and they confiscated the van. And the drones were in there. So I took the drones uh, to Autel um, because they're local. They're in Bothell. And they went through them and found one of the drones they had oh. left the SD card in. <laughs> and um, the I guy, love stupid criminal. <laughs> it was awesome. It was on, you know, it was on the news. It was a great story. Was, and, you know, great. they stole the drones and the drones like caught them. Caught so, them. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it worked out um, well because we did end up getting about two thirds of our stuff back. And so between getting their stuff back and the community um, donations and the companies that came alongside us, we w came out um, better in the end. So we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. One is, um, do you see RC and drone, is it now m morphed from a hobby to a sport? Or 
an attraction. What what is your gauge on it? Um, there's always that like, is it a hobby or is it a sport? I I think it can be both. Um, you know, it depends on you know the person's skill level, and um, you know if you start traveling and you become sponsored and um, you know you're competitive and you're uh, it's more than just passion. It's, you know, you're driven to do these things. Then I think it's a sport. It, when it's a hobby, it's like you you you, you just kind of dabble in it. You may be good, but you don't travel and you don't, um, you know, maybe not be sponsored by somebody. Um, so it's a hard, that's a hard question because it's always one that you get asked. But I think both um, in all the things that we do in RC cars and drone racing, we do uh, crawlers now. And um, because we have the RC park and it's 50 acres. So we have, um, you know, crawlers and airplanes and uh, drones and wings and all of the RC things now at the park. And then on, in the winter, we race indoors. So we're racing the RC cars um, indoors and we do that every two weeks. Oh, that's amazing. So um, I know you're really passionate about what you're doing and it's because of kids, veterans. I mean, there's yeah. like a really sweet spot for yeah. you and what does that what does that look like yeah I think um you know there's something really special uh we'll talk about the kids because um that's you know pretty near and dear to my heart the veterans too but there's there's something really cool about getting the kids involved and um seeing them get excited and yeah. learn yeah. um when they're having fun and they don't even realize they're learning, like they're learning some serious skills. Like they're learning soldering. These RC cars are like a scaled down version of a, of a race car um, that you learn a lot of things that can be uh, used in real life. And you start thinking about how things are built. And um, so, you know, we really uh, have worked hard with uh, our novice programs. Um, I, I haven't heard of a novice program in the nation that's bigger than ours. Um, if if there would, I'd love to meet them. But yeah, nice. um, we usually have about 20 novice uh, or sometimes up to 30 at every race. Uh, and we now are we're sponsored by Team Associated and they gave us um, all these loaner cars. So when kids or new drivers, adults or kids come in, we actually can put a car, uh, a world class RC car. So they're not starting with something that um, isn't the best. They're starting with the best. And we have a whole crew of people. We call it RC University. And these people volunteer their time to work with the novice and mentor them and coach them. Um, it's a lot of kids that came into our novice program, and I call it the Die Hard Leadership Program, because they come in, they've never raced before, and then I slowly transition them into leadership roles where they're teaching other kids how to do that. And it's just, it's really cool to watch the evolution of it. Uh, and our first race was on the about two weeks ago, our, we have a race this weekend, um, and we uh, launched our Die Hard RC Girls program, and we are now sponsoring a, a nine-year-old girl and a 10-year-old girl um, who have both been racing with us for a year, and uh, it just, it it warms my heart because yeah. they, um, their confidence that they're gaining and just the feeling when somebody believes in them that they can do whatever they want to, and you know, RC cars are for girls too. Yeah. Uh, and um, so then they can come in if a girl walks in off the street or they want to learn about it. Uh, I have I have other girls that can welcome them and, right. and talk to them and about it them and themselves. mentor them. And yeah. I think that's important for women and girls to understand is, is that we do... Uh, we do gain something when we mentor each other. It, it's really hard to do it on your own and at any age. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I just want to um, ask one last question. Is And um, where do you see yourself? I mean, where, what's the next steps for you guys? Yeah, um, I, just everything's moving really fast. Uh, what we would really like now, because through the whole story, you hear that we don't have a brick and mortar, we're leasing property, and we get a lease that property seven months out of the year, and then we rent out a, a facility every two weeks for like a Friday night setup and Saturday race, and we tear down and put everything back. It's a lot of work. Uh, 
our, our goal is to have our own facility, to have a technology center and um, indoor and outdoor a facility where we can have a maker space and we can have a STEM classroom and we can have um, indoor and outdoor racing. Um, we can put our micro drone racing programs on indoors throughout the season. And then we can have our outdoor tracks and um, really make it a place where people can come to have fun and. Uh, and what I like to call it is edutainment. So they're learning and having fun at the same time. And something really special happens when um, people are having fun and especially when their parents are there watching right. them or their community is there cheering them on uh, because the community, the RC community is like no other. The, they're so supportive and just um, constantly surprising us in uh, the love that they show. Oh, great. Brenda from Die Hard RC. Thank you so much for being on the Eat Stay Love podcast. I am. Where do we find you? Where, what's your website? Uh, www.diehardrc.com. And you can also uh, email me at brenda at diehardrc.com. Awesome. All right. I'm going to take you up on learning some drone oh, skills. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'll, get, I'll get you flying. All right. I love it. Let's do it. All right. Okay, I want to learn to fly a drone now. <laughs> All right, be sure to check out the Eat, Stay, Love, Snow Co. blog to see the pictures and behind the scenes at www.eatstaylovesnowco.com and for a link to Die Hard RC. Special thanks to Dan Cardenas from Baker Built Works for the AV and technical expertise. And remember to subscribe to hear more great conversations from the awesome people of this community. Peace until next time.